There are times when you need to numb the hand for surgery or a procedure in the ER, and a digital block is just not enough. And at the same time, a brachial plexus block that numbs the whole arm seems like overkill. In these situations, it's super useful to know how to do a wrist block, which we'll cover in detail in this video. Wrist blocks are very handy to know. Get it? Handy? Oh, okay. All right, too early for a dad joke. They're used frequently in hand surgery, for cleaning and sewing up lacerations in the ED, and in the office setting for minor procedures. They're very safe and are simple and quick to perform, but require an understanding of the anatomy. The hand is primarily innervated by three terminal nerves, the median, ulnar, and radial. The median nerve travels down the center of the forearm, passing beneath the flexor retinaculum within the carpal tunnel. The median innervates the palmar aspect of the first, second, third, and lateral half of the fourth digit. It also covers the dorsal aspect of the fingertips of the second, third, and lateral fourth fingers. The ulnar nerve lies just medial to the ulnar artery in the forearm, crossing into the hand to innervate the medial one and a half digits and the corresponding dorsum and palm. Finally, the superficial branch of the radial nerve travels with the radial artery before running over the styloid process toward the dorsum of the wrist and hand. It covers the back of the lateral hand, including the dorsal surface of the thumb. We'll discuss two safe and effective methods to block these nerves at the wrist, the traditional landmark technique and the ultrasound guided technique. We'll talk about the ultrasound guided technique first as it helps us to understand the anatomy. You'll need four 3 mil syringes with your local anesthetic of choice. Depending on our desired duration, we usually use 2% lidocaine or half percent bupivacaine. A 25 or 27 gauge needle is used to reduce tissue trauma. Starting with the hand supinated on a flat surface, the median nerve is easily visualized halfway up the forearm as a piece of popcorn or honeycomb in the fascial plane between the deep and superficial flexors. Using a high frequency linear probe, trace the nerve down toward the wrist where it becomes much more superficial. Note that in the carpal tunnel, there are a handful of tendons handful, somebody stop me, that look just like the median nerve, which is why we trace it down from the forearm to avoid confusion. After sterile skin prep, a 27 gauge needle is inserted out of plane with frequent small pulses of local anesthetic until spread is visualized around the median nerve. A total of three mils is all that's necessary. For the ulnar nerve, we find it helpful to drape the hand over the ultrasound probe, which is held vertically. An assistant can help stabilize the hand and fingers. The ulnar nerve is just medial to the ulnar artery. A 27 gauge needle is passed in plane and hydrodissection used to peel the nerve off the artery. Again, a total of 3 mils of local is more than sufficient. For the radial nerve, the wrist is slightly pronated so the probe can be placed over the radial styloid process. Look for the radial artery and then a small nerve just lateral to that. That's the superficial branch of the radial nerve and as you scan distally it will leave the artery and lie immediately superficial to the styloid process. You can often feel that nerve on yourself as a taut string rolling back and forth over the bone which often elicits a paresthesia. Anyway, back to the block. The needle is inserted out of plane just subcutaneously and 1 to 3 mils administered. Now that we've appreciated the sono anatomy, we can understand the rationale for the landmark based approach. For this, you'll need some skin prep, 4 5 mil syringes of local anesthetic, and a 1 inch 25 or 27 gauge needle. Ask the patient to oppose their thumb and fifth finger and flex the wrist under resistance. This makes the tendons of the palmaris longus and flexor carpi radialis more prominent. The median nerve lies just deep to the flexor retinaculum at the wrist between these two tendons. As we saw with the imaging, it's not very deep. Some resources advocate pushing the needle down to the bone, then withdrawing slightly and injecting. This ultimately fills the carpal tunnel, but it's not necessary. Instead, pass the needle about half to one centimeter deep then gently start to apply pressure on the plunger. It should go easily, reassuring you that the tip is not in a tendon or the median nerve. Five mils of local is slowly injected here. For the ulnar nerve, the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon is palpated. It's the most medial tendon palpable on the wrist crease. A needle is slipped beneath this tendon to a depth of half to one centimeter. Aspiration is important here as the ulnar artery is in the same space. After negative aspiration, five mils of local is slowly injected. Finally, for the radial, the radial styloid process is palpated and 5 mils of local infiltrated subcutaneously.
Massage afterwards can help spread the local and accelerate the block onset. There are two more nerves that need mention because these can frequently be the source of an incomplete block. First, the ulnar nerve gives off a dorsal cutaneous branch 5 or 6 centimeters above the ulnar styloid, and it runs in the subcutaneous tissue between the ulnar styloid and the FCU tendon. It's responsible for the dorsum of the medial hand and is occasionally missed when doing a pure ulnar nerve block. For that reason, when I'm doing an ulnar nerve block, I always save 1 to 1.5 mils to inject subcutaneously on the way out, which gets the job done nicely. The other pesky nerve is the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, which is the cutaneous part of the musculocutaneous nerve. While most anatomic diagrams have this nerve ending at the wrist crease, nature is a little underhanded, underhanded, come on, and allows some cross innervation on the thenar eminence. If you don't address this, you'll have the odd carpal tunnel patient react to incision. This is easily addressed by infiltrating across the lateral wrist crease and is the reason for the fourth syringe in our setup. The biggest thing I care about here is nerve injury. Be gentle, inject slowly, and if you can, use ultrasound to make sure you're not piercing any of the delicate nerves. What about a motor block? Can a patient with a wrist block move his or her fingers? The answer is yes, because most of the muscles that flex and extend the fingers are in the forearm. So that's something to be aware of. The patient won't feel anything, but they may try to play Moonlight Sonata during the operation if they're bored. Nothing a hand immobilizer can't fix. And that's it. Wrist blocks are easy to do and are an essential part of the toolkit for hand surgeons, anesthesiologists, ER, and sports medicine docs. 